Amyloidosis is a disorder of protein misfolding and extracellular deposition. So you've got normally folded proteins that kink and misfold and then aggregate into amyloid fibrils and uh, deposit in the uh, extracellular space, um, as we can see here down the bottom there. And that the fibrils themselves um, can be uh, extremely uh, stable. And it's, it was actually the, the word amyloid comes from uh, the, the um, a word meaning starch-like. So it can be very hard and very insoluble. And because it has a variety of different presentations, it can um, involve many specialties and can be easily missed. Um, why is that not working? Ah, yeah. So one of the problems is that the way amyloidosis is classified is according to the precursor protein that's misfolded in the first place. So there's over 36 different proteins that can, um, uh, that can make amyloids. So hopefully you've memorized all of those now. Uh, fortunately, there's really only three major ones that we need to worry about, and there's only two that really affect the heart. So AA, I won't talk about uh, tonight. That's a that's what used to be called secondary amyloidosis. If you've had chronic inflammation for 15 years or so, um, <clears throat> AA is actually a uh, related protein to CRP, and so very high levels for a chronic period can make AA amyloidosis, which is a renal disease. Um, I also won't go over hereditary disease, um, except one slide about hereditary TTR. So really my presentation tonight, could, because you're all very intelligent cardiologists, I thought I would uh, focus more on AL and ATTR. So ATTR accounts, we think probably for about 50% of all cases um, of amyloidosis. And uh, hopefully tonight you'll sort of realize that this is really um, a very underdiagnosed and undertreated disease. So that's caused by the transthyretin program, uh, protein. So transthyretin stands for transports, thyroid and uh, retinol. So TTR or transthyretin is um, a, a form of amyloidosis that causes heart failure typically in older men. Uh, <clears throat> AL amyloidosis is due to the misfolding of an, an excessive amount of light chains, monoclonal light chains, as we see in myeloma or MGUS. Um, and so it's absolutely vital that um, whenever we see a potential new cardiac amyloidosis that we always, always, always look for a monoclonal protein. And we do that with serum electrophoresis, serum free light chains, and by urine electrophoresis looking for bench Jones protein. There are localized forms of amyloid, which we don't really need to worry about. And I won't talk too much about. You can have it in the eyelid, you can have it in the bladder, you can have it in the uh, tracheal bronchial regions. Um, and they just need to either be just observed or locally excised and their outcomes are, are very, very good. Um, and I mentioned that I won't go too much about hereditary um, because I think that that's really a, a quite a specialized area, but I will talk about it just in, in terms of transthyretin. So the problem is that we're missing the diagnosis. The earlier the diagnosis, the better the outcome. And you can see here that a third of patients wait for over a year from the time of symptoms to actually getting a proper diagnosis um, in a third can be more than a year. Um, but more worrying is that half the patients see four doctors or more in order to get the right diagnosis. And unfortunately, cardiologists have sort of let the side down a little bit with only one in five uh, the, the, uh, cases of amyloidosis is back in 2015 being diagnosed by cardiologists and given that uh, 50 to 70 percent of all cases of amyloidosis actually has cardiac involvement uh, I think that it's great that we're having uh, this presentation today so um, I think that that is changing I think cardiologists are becoming a lot more aware which is fantastic um, and we're diagnosing the disease earlier um, I mentioned the transthyretin amyloidosis uh, can be either acquired or wild type. This used to be called senile systemic amyloidosis. The older white men that got this didn't like being called, uh, being told that they have a, a senile amyloidosis. They much prefer to be called wild type. Um, so the majority of patients will have wild type if you can't call someone as having wild type disease without doing the genotyping. Um, 
So, but 90% of cases uh, are wild type or acquired. Um, so about two thirds to three quarters will have a preceding carpal tunnel syndrome, many of whom would have actually had releases. So if you see anyone um, with heart failure and a history of carpal tunnel syndrome, always think about lordosis. So when you're there and you're checking their pulse, have a look for the carpal tunnel release scars, um, especially if they're older men over the age of 60 and if it's bilateral. Um, and if you have any suspicion, then you should order a bone scan. And I'll go through the importance of that soon. So I just want to do something here. No, that's not going to work. Okay. Um, and if there's any doubt as to how common this is, so this was a study done by the Spanish and has been reduced, uh, reproduced several times. So this is looking at uh, people over the age of 60 um, with HFPF and left ventricular hypertrophy of more than 12 millimetres. Um, and what they found was in 13% of those cases, so in one in eight, they actually had amyloidosis. So if you've got anyone with a thickened wall um, and HFPF, then you really need to uh, consider that this patient has amyloidosis and uh, go on and do bone scintigraphy. Uh, I mentioned carpal tunnel syndrome. The other thing that's increasingly being found is that, uh, that transthyretin can also uh, be in the ligamentum flavum, causing spinal canal stenosis, requiring laminectomy. Uh, about two or three weeks ago, we had the International Amyloidosis Symposium virtually. Uh, this is a series done in Boston, which looked at 324 consecutive laminectomies for spinal canal stenosis. And it was found that again in 13%, uh, so one in eight roughly, um, they found that uh, people who went for laminectomy, actually the cause of that was amyloid deposition. Within the uh, so again, if you have anyone uh, that has uh, HFPF and needs to go for lam laminectomy, uh, think of amyloid and do bone scintigraphy. Um, I'm not the best person as a haematologist to tell you how to read an um, echocardiogram, uh, but some of the features that we do see, this obviously some pretty old slides, is incre increased left ventricular wall thickness, not hypertrophy, because it's amyloid depositing in between the cells. Um, the left ventricular, uh, left ventricle is typically small and older, uh, the oldest um, descriptions used to uh, talk about a speckling pattern, uh, seen uh, because of increased <clears throat> myocardial echo echogenicity. Thickened right ventricular lateral wall is often um, a sign with biatrial enlargement, as you can see here. Thickened valves will also um, make you think uh, maybe something's going on. Systolic function is relatively preserved. I can tell you I'm still getting probably one in 10 saying this is unlikely to be amyloid because the rejection fraction is normal. Well, it's usually normal. Uh, so I, that certainly it's, it's more a, a, a diastology issue rather than um, a, syst a systolic issue. And um, the pericardial effusions uh, are minor but common. Global longitudinal fund should be ordered on every single echocardiogram you do when amyloidosis is suspected. It's just so helpful. So we know that if the global longitudinal strain is less than 10%, outcomes are poorer. Uh, we typically have apical sparing that should really alert you to the fact that this could be amyloidosis. Um, and you know, compared to um, such things as Hockham or aortic stenosis, um, and there's that sort of uh, cherry on the top of the cake appearance is, is highly suggestive, or the bullseye um, uh, view can be highly suggestive. Cardiac MRI is extremely useful. Um, obviously, you get better pictures of anatomy. Um, with the classic characteristic late gadolinium enhancement. You have to remember that cardiac MRI is not 100% sensitive or specific uh, for amyloidosis and it cannot distinguish between the AL and ATTR types, unfortunately. But if you do have an echo where you're not quite sure could this be amyloid or not, it is a, a very helpful tool. So the, the game changer was bone scintigraphy. So the history of this is um, that a group of Norwegians about 30 years ago were doing um, lots of uh, bone scans on their older uh, male patients with a history of prostate cancer. And they found that in a small percentage, their hearts lit up like Christmas trees, as you can see here. 
biopsies proved that this was uh, due to amyloid. And as time went on, uh, it was increasingly recognized that this is a highly sensitive um, uh, 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 way of picking up cardiac amyloidosis. The big problem we have with bone scintigraphy is that we need to make sure that we're actually using the right tracer. So there are three tracers that um, can be used, which is DPD, PYP, so the PYP is what we usually use in Melbourne, and HDMP can also be used, that's also common. DPD probably gives the best pictures, as we can see here, um, but it's harder to, uh, harder to get. Um, so there are two ways of grading the uptake. Um, so the classic was the Perigini score. So grade one, there's no cardiac uptake. Um, grade, so grade naught, no cardiac uptake. Grade one, there's a little bit of uptake, not quite as intense as the ribs. Uh, grade two, it's round about the same intensity. Grade three, there's almost no bone signal and it's almost all taken up by the heart. If you have grade two or grade three, it's most likely gonna be TTR, but not always. Um, so TTR is always positive, pretty much, with the exception to one or two very rare hereditary mutations. Um, but with AL, a third of them can also be positive. So we do still have this problem of distinguishing between the AL and the TTR types. Um, so it's really important that we measure the serum electrophoresis, the serum free light chains, and the urine electrophoresis which, with every new patient. If, no, if there is no plasma cell dyscrasia detected, if the serum electrophoresis and light chains are all normal, no bench chains protein, and they have a grade two or grade three bone scan, this patient has TTR amyloidosis. We don't need to do a biopsy. So it's really been extremely helpful. If they do have a plasma cell clone, uh, we then need to go on and do a biopsy. But the bone scan and MRI has really um, been extraordinary. And you can see here, this is a, a study done by the British, um, the institution of uh, cardiac MRI in the early noughties, saw an increased diagnosis, but it was really DPD bone scintigraphy that was introduced in 2010 that saw a massive upswing. Um, certainly when we set up the statewide service about six years ago, we were getting maybe a, a new TTR patient every month or two. Now we're getting one to two new diagnoses a week. Um, and so it's, it's really um, an underdiagnosed condition. So if you've never read this article, this is the one that I think is really key because it, it, it does really help um, you work out what the algorithm is here. So if you have a patient with heart failure, syncope, bradyarrhythmia with echocardiogram or cardiac MRI, features suggestive of cardiac amyloidosis, go on and do a bone scan. If it's grade naught, it's unlikely to uh, be TTR, almost never. Um, still go on and do the monoclonal protein analysis. Uh, if, you know, it's unlikely uh, then to be amyloid if that's also negative. If it's grade one um, or grade two and three, then you can see there that, we, um, that there's an algorithm of whether it's TTR or AL and we need further biopsies. Um, annoyingly as well, for reasons that we don't understand, if you have transthyretin amyloidosis, um, it's quite common to have an MGAS as well. And this has been reproduced throughout the States here and in the UK, as well as in, um, the, in continental Europe. Um, so for those that either have a negative bone scan, but um, other imaging is suggestive of amyloidosis, and in all patients with a detectable plasma cell dyscrasia, we still need to go on and do a biopsy. So the classic, as you probably remember, is Congo Red um, for uh, amyloid. So you can see here the sort of salmon pink uh, readiness that we can see in, 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 uh, in large glomeruli. Uh, that is apple green birefringent under polarized light. And then we need to go on and do immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence to determine whether this, this is the AL or the TTR type. So it's really essential um, that we do Kappa and Lambda on all of our um, uh, biopsies to try to look for AL and for cardiac biopsies, they must have transthyretin staining. If your lab doesn't do it, then send it to one that does. Um, the organ in question is always a, a, a difficult one. I get asked this a lot. Do we have to go and biopsy the heart? And the answer is, no, um, 
bone marrow biopsy, especially in, you know, if, you, if you've got someone with a detectable plasma cell dyscrasia, we can do a bone marrow biopsy. As you can see here, the sensitivity is only about 63%. So, <clears throat> and it's sometimes quite difficult to determine is it AL or TTR just on the bone marrow. What about abdominal fat? Well, it's great if they do have AL, so in 84% of the time we'll be able to pick it up, but if it's wild type TTR, it's only positive in one in eight patients. So we often find that this delays things quite a lot by doing screening biopsies. So often it's, it's just easier and quicker just to go straight for, for the money and go for the heart. Or if there's any, any evidence of kidney involvement, such as protein urea, then go for a kidney biopsy. Um, one of the problems is that we still see issues with biopsies. This is probably the hardest thing. So in a two series of over 300 biopsies, we saw that um, there was a false negative rate of 9%. So if you've got someone who you really think that this patient definitely has amyloid, um, and you know, you've got a specky little biopsy and you're not quite sure and the, and the histopathologist isn't very experienced, please feel free to um, uh, send it over to us and we're very happy to um, have, give a second opinion for free. Um, we also noticed that um, when we get these um, referrals that only half of the cases have had any immunohistochemistry performed. So there's this thought of, oh, they've got amyloid and they've got a detectable plasma cell dyscrasia, they must have AL. And that's just not the case. As you can see there in the previous slide that about a quarter of patients will have TTR and an inconsequential, irrelevant MGUS. So it's really important that we do the immunohistochemistry. Um, when we had a look at these 300 biopsies, again, we found one in eight cases that the, it was actually misdiagnosed that the, the subtype was wrong. And of course that you risk getting incorrect treatment. So if in doubt, refer to an Australian amyloidosis network service, such as the one at Box Hill or at the Alfred or order mass spectrometry. We can do electron microscopy. Um, so that will help you diagnose that the patient has amyloid if in doubt. So this is usually more relevant for um, if you think they might have light chain deposition disease, um, which is a related disorder, um, and it's usually more related to renal amyloidosis. Mass spectrometry can be very helpful in um, uh, cardiac biopsies where we really can't, we really struggle to determine whether it's AL or TTR. Um, we can, there are three main places that we can do it. Brisbane, uh, there's a very long turnaround time, usually about three months. That is free. If you send patients to the, a um, AAN site, um, uh, such as Box Hill or the Alfred, we can get mass spectrometry done for free at the National Amyloidosis Centre in the UK. Um, and the turnaround time is only about six to eight weeks instead. Or the Mayo Clinic, um, and that should be $2,000, not $200. So the Mayo does do a very quick service, but you do need to get the biopsies over there and it's not cheap. So that's diagnosis. So you can see the importance of doing the serum electrophoresis, the serum free light chains and the bench Jones proteins when you suspect amyloid. But the other thing that's really helpful um, when you're referring patients is to do the cardiac biomarkers. Because when we're staging both AL and TTR amyloidosis, the NT pro BMP is key. Little bit of a, tr a trick for young players, NT pro BMP can either be uh, reported as nanograms per litre or picomoles per litre. Um, and the difference between the two is ninefold. Um, so always note what, what units of measurements have been used. Um, so you can see here um, that for AL amyloidosis, the most commonly used uh, staging system is the revised MERS staging system, which uses, uses a combination of troponin T nt pro -BMP and the difference between the involved and the uninvolved monoclonal serum-free light chains. So if your light chains are up and they're misfolding, they're making amyloid that's depositing in the heart, causing the amyloidosis, that's the sort of classic um, type that you, your heart sinks. You know, if there's very heavy and involved cardiac um, disease, you can see there if you've got stage four disease on the, on the, uh, the, the, the gray curve, that half your patients will be dead within six months. Um, if you don't have significant cardiac involvement, so if the nt pro -BMP and the troponin T are relatively normal or only slightly elevated, these patients can live, you can see that, you know, 75% are living more than five years. 
Um, so there's a big difference. So the earlier we can diagnose patients, um, the better their, their outcome. This was published in 2012, and I think things have certainly improved for those stage one to three. The stage four still continue to be a challenge, which I'll go through. So again, earlier diagnosis means that they don't have a more progressed stage and the better the survival. Um, there is, this is a, a, another analysis um, that was done around about the same time where they really tried to um, uh, spread out and distinguish between those with really high NT proprium P's and those not so high. And you can see that for those with, with very high um, NT proprium P, so that equates to about 900 picomoles per litre of NT proprium P, um, their outcomes are really very dismal. And they're a real um, challenging uh, group to deal with. You still can see though, that even in that horrifically bad line, that 20% of patients will live three to four years and 10% will live beyond seven years. So it's still worthwhile in some of those patients trying to treat and seeing if we can make a difference. And this is really the reason why. So we know that if we can rapidly decrease the clone that is causing uh, the cardiac AL amyloidosis, patients can live for you know, quite some time. So if you have no response, that's NR, we know that those patients are usually dead within three months. If they have a partial response, we reduce the clone by 50% or so, then those patients can live for up to eight months. But if they have a VGPR, that means a 90% reduction in the light chains, um, or they have a complete response that the light chains normalize, then the median time of survival is more than three years. And these are patients who have got really advanced cardiac amyloidosis. So speed is the key. So if you've got someone uh, with a newly diagnosed um, significant cardiac amyloidosis, refer to us as, as soon as you possibly can. We can you know, confirm that this is AL and devise a, a rapid management plan. And we're very happy to uh, speak to you over the phone um, about starting some treatment urgently if you've, there's a high index of suspicion that this is AL and not TTR. So again, deeper responses, earlier, earlier diagnosis and deeper responses when you do make the diagnosis in AL amyloidosis is equated to a better survival. So even the most advanced patients, we would at least consider some treatment. When we're looking at treatment of AL amyloidosis, we, we, we um, target it at various ways. So classically, we've always targeted the um, excessive light chains, the monoclonal light chains that are making the amyloid and depositing in the heart. Um, so we do that um, by old fashioned alkylators such as cyclophosphamide melphalan, steroids, especially dexamethasone, we do stem cell transplants uh, in the selected patients. We use immunomodulatory therapy such as lenalidomide. I'm not expecting you to know about all different types of chemotherapies. This is just a, a broad idea. Um, Velcade I'll go into because that's quite important. It's a proteasome inhibitor. I'll we'll also go over daratunumab because that's going to increasingly be used. And venetoclax is some new targeted therapy that we use in lymphoma and leukemia, which has been very promising um, in patients uh, with a particular mutation um, translocation between chromosomes 11 and 14. Really interestingly is that um, there have been uh, in vitro and mouse model experiments looking at doxycycline. Um, and doxycycline seems to um, inhibit some of the um, functions um, and the uh, fibrillogenesis of the misfold of proteins. Uh, and also seems to be protecting against some of the um, toxicity of uh, the oligomers before they actually stick together and, and make fibrils. Um, and this is, this is really interesting. So there was the, the Mayo Clinic again in the States, they usually will give penicillin prophylaxis to their patients um, after an autologous stem cell transplant. Um, and what they found was that those who uh, were allergic to penicillin, um, they were given doxycycline. They went back and had a look at a retrospective, at a, they had a retrospective look of their, of their patients um, and they divided them between those who got penicillin prophylaxis afterwards and, and doxycycline. Um, and what they found was that the doxycycline group actually lived far longer than those for penicillin. So there was thought that there is something in this. Um, and generally speaking, there around the world, there was some other smaller studies, um, again, retrospective, unfortunately, 
um, which seem to suggest that doxycycline has a role. So generally we would give doxycycline if tolerated to most of our patients now. Um, EGCG is green tea extract. Um, there is a little bit of data, uh, again, mainly in vitro and mouse models that would suggest that there's um, a similar sort of efficacy there. Of course, the, the golden thing that we want is to be able to uh, remove amyloid that's already in the heart, if at all possible, to speed up recovery. There were three main monoclonal antibodies um, that were looked at. One didn't seem to work. One had um, off-target toxicity. Um, but there are some newer um, monoclonal antibodies coming forward and some trials in 3A and 3B uh, stage AL amyloidosis will be commencing within the next three to six months. So again, if you've got any advanced stage cardiac AL amyloidosis patients, um, please let me know because we are uh, desperately looking for patients to enrol in this study. We are very excited by it. So yeah, so treatment is usually, we usually use bortezomib, which is a, a subcutaneous weekly injection, proteasome inhibitor with an old alkylator cyclophosphamide and a steroid. And we use autologous stem cell transplantations in those who are fit enough to receive it. And I mentioned doxycycline as an antifibrillogenic agent. Uh, I won't go over this too much, uh, just to say that Velcade Bortezomib has been demonstrated in studies, including in Australia, to have an increased overall um, survival, which is, which is really key. And that's led to this study, which is a major study conducted over the last two years, looking at Velcade with sarcophosphorine and dexamethasone with or without a novel monoclonal antibody, uh, which targets the plasma cells that are making the light chains that are depositing into the heart. Um, and this, this really was a highly positive study. Daratunumab really uh, was incredibly effective. And you can see here that the cardiac response rates doubled. So when we look at, when we talk about cardiac responses, we, we really talk about improvements in the cardiac biomarkers, in particular the nt pro -BNP. Um, and uh, what, we, what we see here is that half the patients had a 30 to 50% uh, reduction in their nt pro -BMP and that their general function, the six minute walk tests and all other things that were sort of a measure of um, efficacy were, were measured in this and we, we saw uh, really impressive organ response rates. Um, with the addition of daratunumab. And we can also use it for relapse disease and we can see that there is significant reduction in the pathogenic light chains um, in these patients, even just with one injection. So it's, it's pretty impressive. The deeper the response, uh, the higher the chance of an organ response. So we now look at very sensitive markers. So a partial remission is not really good enough. We really try to go for a complete, uh, complete response or even doing very sensitive flow techniques, looking for minimal residual disease. And those that are MRD negative have a much higher chance of getting a uh, cardiac response. And you can see here, with the Italians that they uh, noted that if you have a complete remission and uh, MOD negative, um, that the, uh, the, the response rates for the organs in, in the heart were up at uh, above 90%, which is just extraordinary. There are some guidelines which um, the Myeloma Scientific Advisory Group have written. So if you want to learn more about the supportive care or the chemotherapy involved in this, please feel free to have a look at that. That's available online or give me a buzz. I can send you out a memory stick. Um, but most of you are probably quite interested in TTR amyloidosis. So if we talk about TTR amyloidosis, again, the nt pro -BMP is key for staging um, and the EGFR, the, the, the the kidney function. So basically we call this the Gilmore staging system and it can be divided really between uh, stage one, which is very early onset disease, low NT-proBNP NT and preserved kidney function. And those patients in general um, without treatment will live roughly about six years. Um, for those who, are, who have got one of the NT-proBNP or the EGFR, that's stage two, um, they typically live about four years and stage three have about a two year median survival. Um, and again, this just highlights earlier diagnosis equates to better survival. Um, when we talk about treatments, 
uh, again, we need to have a look at what the process is to actually making amyloid. So the liver produces uh, the vast amount of TTR. Um, TTR generally will uh, float around as a tetramer, as a foursome, as a four leaf clover. Um, through pro proteolysis and shear forces, we can see that these, um, that these uh, uh, transthyretins are uh, break up into monomers, either full or truncated, then that, that allows them to misfold, to aggregate and to form fibrils. So the original treatment for TTR amyloidosis was liver transplantation because over 95% of TTR is made by the liver. Um, however, that's a pretty extreme way of, of treating a disease and now there are gene silencing um, uh, medications such as silencing RNA or antisense oligonucleotide therapy, such as inotercin or patisseran. And there are some, now some second generation um, forms that are subcutaneous of these, which are really very exciting. And will be um, starting trials any moment within Melbourne. Um, the classic tetramer stabilizers, so you've probably heard of Tefamidus, that was in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago. This helps to stabilize the tetrama and prevent it from um, uh, uh, separating into monomers and then misfolding. Um, the one thing we can get now is diflunazole, that's an old non steroidal anti inflammatory agent, which again acts as a tetrama, is probably better than Tefamidus, um, but has much greater toxicity. And AG10 um, has even more intense binding, and we've just had a trial, trial of that um, in Melbourne and uh, throughout Australia. Um, and there's more intense binding, and that looks very, very promising. Uh, there is a, an antibody uh, targeting aggregated TTR, and that, that uh, antibody is called PRX004, and we're waiting to hear about trials with that. And again, we look at doxycycline and I'll mention green tea as well because it's relevant in this area. This is another slide sort of uh, really saying the same thing, the liver, the tetramer, the monomer, the misfolded monomer, the amyloid fibrils. Um, and you can see that TTR stabilization has been our mainstay of treatment. Um, we can get diflunazole and doxycycline in green tea. Um, and you can see on the right hand side there that doxycycline also help, helps to unravel um, uh, intact fibrils. Um, so that's where we are with TTR at the moment uh, in terms of the basics. So if we have a look at the evidence, so this is a really interesting a bit retrospective um, uh, uh, survival curve of those uh, patients on a stabilizer versus not on a stabilizer and they looked they did a multivariate analysis looking at all different things age sex um, ethnicity kidney function etc etc and with every parameter the only thing that really came out very striking was if you're on a stabilizer either tefamidus or diflunazole you did better now diflunazole being an old old style um, anti-inflammatory needs to be given with food. We have to watch the kidneys. I put everyone on a PPI. Um, interestingly, we've had probably about, uh, I think it was about 150 patients we've treated with diflunazole. Most, the 70 or so that have had to come off um, are usually, have usually had to come off because of renal impairment, not because of bleeding. Um, so with PPI, even when you're on a NOAC or whatever for atrial fibrillation, it doesn't seem to cause gastric toxicity. It seems to be the combination of diflunazole um, with the diuretics sometimes can cause some uh, renal dysfunction. It's so important just to remember though, diflunazole is, is a non-steroidal. If you have that with diuretics and an ACE inhibitor, that's how we've actually given medical nephrectomy is with a non-steroidal, a diuretic and an ACE inhibitor. So if you go on diflunazole, you have to stop your ACE inhibitor or angiotensin II blocker really important. Doxycycline, I've mentioned, it can also be used with uh, toro urso deoxycholic acid. Um, there are some very small studies which demonstrated um, some stabilization in the NT pro BNP um, and possibly some improvement in quality of life and uh, weight. Um, but again, not fantastic um, evidence. Obviously doxycycline is not without toxicity in some patients. Um, there are some ongoing studies uh, looking at doxycycline, but it's a reasonable adjunctive to give to patients with TTR. 
I mentioned that EGCG is actually green tea extract. You have to drink two litres of green tea a day to get um, the right amounts um, uh, that is going to be therapeutic. We uh, do use it because a lot of patients like the so-called natural therapies. Um, so you can have you can have a look here. We've had this is uh, starting to get a little bit old now. It's two uh, two years old. We had 31 patients treated with green tea, um, and you can see there um, that some had it with diflunisol or doxycycline, or even some with triple therapy. What we found um, was, in actual fact, those that were on it for uh, six months or more, they actually did pretty well. So you can see here that 80% of patients had their antiprobium P was stable, or in actual fact, in about one in eight, we saw a decreasing in the antiprobium P, which seemed to be above and beyond uh, just uh, stabilizing their fluid overload. Very high doses of green tea extract can cause some liver toxicity, so we do need to look out for that and just make sure that we check the liver function. Amazingly, uh, this in particular with hematologists, we do supportive care, I think, very poorly. So if you've got someone with TTR amyloidosis or even AL amyloidosis with cardiac involvement, it's really important that we actually type, you know, like do the basic um, cardiac failure nurse type stuff, titrate the diuretics according to what they need. Loop diuretics with spironolactone seem to be particularly helpful, but we often forget to tell patients to be on a low salt diet. So ask them how much salt do you have and tell them to cut it out um, and to be on a fluid restriction. I've put cessation of ACE inhibitors and or beta blockers. Um, this is a slightly controversial point. Um, ACE inhibitors generally are very poorly, poorly, poorly tolerated, especially causing postural hypotension in significant cardiac amyloidosis. There is, there's never been any evidence that ACE inhibitors are, have any really great role. So I would only use ACE inhibitors and only a very small dose um, in those patients with significant systolic impairments as well. And they're pretty rare. Beta blockers can be useful, obviously, in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, um, but generally speaking, a lot of us uh, around the world, uh, including cardiologists, would use amiodarone or adjuvant in, in low doses. Albumin infusions can also be helpful if patients have a really low albumin because of nephrotic range proteinuria, for instance. Neuropathy is common in AL, not so common in the TTR, although it's definitely um, seen. Uh, however, sort of a cardiac cachexia is really common. So patients generally don't eat as much. They have early satiety. Um, I think that's, you know, really key. And, and, and I think that a prokinetic is very helpful. If they're not on amiodarone, I usually give them domperidone. Otherwise, I give them metoclopramide. So feel free to prescribe prokinetics because it really can make a difference. But what about defamatous? This is the hope of the side because it's a once a day pill. It's very easy. It's a great stabilizer. Um, so I won't go through a lot of these slides because it does go on for quite some time, but Tefamidus is um, a once a day pill now, which has been demonstrated in the hereditary form of amyloidosis to uh, slow the progression of neuropathy associated with TTR and improved uh, patient's quality of life. This is their neuropathy scores, um, but unfortunately it didn't actually meet its primary endpoint. So Tefamidus never was licensed in, in a lot of countries because it actually didn't meet its endpoint. Um, so, and again, you know, even with long-term follow-up, there was, you know, some benefit um, and it's very well tolerated. Um, the ATTRACT study is what we've probably heard about, the Mayer um, uh, manuscript that was published in the New England Journal, um, and that looked at two doses of defamatus compared to placebo. And we found that after 18 months, the survival curve started to separate. Now, there are some issues with this study. Um, one of the issues is that they, uh, they classify patients according to NYHA. So of course, patients, if you tighten up the diuresis or you, you're a bit loose um, with it, then that may actually change things a little bit. So we need to be a little bit more, we have to be cautious with the NYHA grading. They have never allowed analysis of this data according to Gilmore stage. And I think that that's a real, a real problem with this, with this article, because we know that Gilmore stage three disease, that's those that have 
a high NT pro BMP and a low EGFR, we know their median survival is two years. So if these patients have, if, if you've got a patient with Gilmore stage three disease, we think it's very unlikely um, that patients uh, will actually have a, a significant um, uh, improvement in their quality of life or their survival with defamatous alone. But watch this space. Um, uh, this is a very interesting slide looking at uh, the TTR binding, the stabilization of the TTR tetramer, whether it's with defamatous, diflunazel, or AG10. You can see here that of the three, defamatous seems to be the weakest. Diflunazel, the non-steroidal I mentioned before, which we can get now, um, it is available in Victoria, um, that seems to be better than defamatous. But being a non-steroidal, it does have potential toxicities and AG10 looks very promising. And we wait for the results of the, um, of the study on that. Um, so again, we'll go back. I'll, I'm going to talk now about um, some newer therapies which are, are coming on board, which look really, really um, exciting. So if you, we know that we can, we can survive just fine thanks with uh, only 10% of our normal levels of TTR. So suppressing uh, the production of TTR uh, seems ex an extremely exciting way of doing things. And I think by combining it with stabilizer, that hopefully TTR amyloidosis will uh, be a very easily treated uh, uh, therapy long-term. So patisseran um, uh, can decrease the plasma concentrations of TTR by about 85%. Um, and this was subcutaneous with um, very well tolerated um, and only some mild injection site reactions. Um, this is um, the original Apollo study, which um, really showed the decrease um, in the TTR knockdown. Very, very, very impressive. This was the uh, neuropathy study, similar to the Tefamidus one I mentioned before. They used neuropathy first, um, and we saw uh, essentially a cessation of uh, the progression of disease. Um, in these patients, which is really, really exciting. The placebo continued uh, to decrease neurological function. And this was seen uh, in all sexes, ages, races, um, uh, hereditary genotypes, etc. So really this was a massive game changer. Um, Inertesin is a similar um, uh, uh, formulation. Um, so uh, this was also used in uh, in patients with a hereditary neuropathy. This did not completely stop the progression, but was, uh, it was significantly slowed down. So again, I think inotercin with a stabilizer could probably do just as good a job as patisseran, but we don't know that for sure. And that's why I think it is, it is really important that we um, uh, keep a, uh, an eye and participate in clinical trials. Um, so inotercin possibly uh, was, possibly not tolerated quite as well. Um, so we did see that about a quarter of patients did have to drop out. Um, we did see um, some occasional renal events and uh, a couple of uh, thrombocytopenic issues uh, with this. So given that it didn't seem quite as effective as patisseran, it had some uh, some um, uh, some toxicities. Uh, we wonder whether patisseran will win the race in this one, but of course it all um, comes down to market forces and price. So we are pretty excited um, uh, by the fact that those sorts of um, therapies, patisseran and inotercin and the second generation formulations are about to be launched in clinical trials for ATTR wild type. Um, moving just finally on to some of the uh, uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies that will, are being looked at to see if we can actually remove amyloid. So this is an SAP scan that's available in London. It binds to amyloid. You can see um, with the patient on the left uh, that they had amyloid patchy amyloid deposition in their liver and spleen. And then after this monoclonal antibody, we saw a significant reduction 
and the, the, the patient on um, the right hand side, patient 13, did extraordinarily well where there was basically resolution of all amyloid deposition within the liver with this anti-serum amyloid P monoclonal antibody. One of the problems, unfortunately, uh, with, this, um, with this antibody was um, that it did cause uh, some ischemic vasculitis within the bowel and, and some, some renal issues. Uh, and so unfortunately, GSK has put this on hold. I think it's a huge tragedy. Um, I think that we should be looking at uh, ways to still use this because um, there are some hereditary forms of amyloid for which we have no other treatment and many patients would take the risk. I mentioned previously before about PRX004 um, in ATTR amyloidosis. Um, that's been significantly delayed in uh, starting clinical trials and we wait to see from Prothena what they're going to do. But that is um, still something potentially of, ex of excitement. This, this uh, monoclonal antibody is the last man standing um, and this looks incredibly impressive. Um, and stage, uh, sorry, phase three clinical trials in AL amyloidosis will be starting within the next three months for very advanced cardiac disease. So again, if you do have a patient, I think it'd be great if you could refer that on because uh, the, the, you can see the change um, uh, in the anti and p in those patients treated um, uh, with uh, th this monoclonal antibody it looks really exciting and the phase two, two um, data is, is extraordinary. So this is a patient treated with patisseran and tifamidus. Uh, it's a bone scan, uh, one on the left um, before they um, have had treatment and then 12 months later you can actually see that the amount of amyloid deposited uh, had significantly reduced. So if you actually um, with AL amyloidosis, we know that patients can get significantly better with appropriate treatment, and we feel that the same could potentially happen with the TTR amyloidosis. So just a reminder that diflunazole is available at Eastern Health, um, and I think it's probably the best treatment we have available right now in TTR amyloidosis. Doxycycline and green tea, the evidence is weak, but um, with, uh, with no other treatments available, it's reasonable to try. EGCG, that green tea extract, there shouldn't be more than 600 milligrams a day. Um, Defamidus uh, is going up to, for the PBAC for PBS reimbursement um, early next year, and we keep our fingers crossed for that. AG10, the trials have just closed. We wait for the long-term results of that. And trials of um, subcutaneous forms of both patisserone and inotercin gene silencers are about to start in Melbourne uh, within the next three to six months. So again, please feel free to refer patients to us. And I'm just trying to remember if that's my last slide. No, it's not. So... Yeah, just a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more uh, of a reminder that Diflunazel, the dose is 250 milligrams twice a day. This is what we do at the Victorian and Tasmanian Amyloidosis Service. Um, that's our first line therapy. We add a PPI such as SOMAC, 40 milligrams a day. We monitor the renal function. If it goes off by more than 20, 25%, we stop. Um, and just remember to stop the ACE inhibitor, otherwise you will give them renal failure, which is not cool. Doxycycline, the, the therapeutic dose is 100 milligrams twice a day, so quite a large amount. Um, and of course we have to watch for photosensitivity and reflux. Um, and green tea extract I mentioned, um, no, no more than about 600 a day, monitor the liver function. Um, and, but I do think that some patients swear by the grain too, interestingly enough. So we formed the Australian Amyloidosis Network because as you can see that there's a growing need for centres of excellence for this because it can be quite complicated. Um, so the three major centres opened some time ago. Um, we are now a network as of the last four years. We are looking for young, bright things who are interested in amyloidosis research. Um, you know, PhDs, etc. There's loads of uh, patients and um, uh, data. I mean, I've got lots of stuff I can do, I just don't have the time. So, um, there is a center and lots of other 
um, in, in most states and hopefully we'll, we will be combining also with the, with the Kiwi soon as well. There's a website, there is a, a you can see there, amyloidosis.net.au, there is a health professionals um, section that goes through a lot of what I've just said tonight um, and that's updated regularly including a clinical trials page as well. So please feel free to check that out about what's actually um, available. Just a reminder that um, if we look at amyloidosis as a whole, 50 to 70% will have cardiac involvement. This is AL amyloidosis um, uh, survival curves that you can see. There's a massive difference between those with cardiac involvement and those without. And uh, certainly cardiac disease is directly correlated with survival. And so it's really the relationship with the hematologist and cardiologist, I think is really, really helpful. Um, and that's why we have um, had an aim of setting up multidisciplinary teams in each state and to do some research and regist registry work and continue with that uh, high degree. So please come and see me um, if you're interested in doing any further work in this. Um, we are getting better with survival. So this is AL amyloidosis on the left-hand side. Um, you can see that over time we have seen a slow improvement. This is Mayo Clinic data. Um, so, but we still struggle in those first three months with significant cardiac disease. On the right hand side, I mentioned that this is, um, uh, we've got the Gilmore staging system. I think that this is the Mayo staging system. Um, again, looking at, um, at survival. So patients uh, uh, typically will die younger if they have TTR amyloidosis and hopefully with some of the treatments we can delay this. Um, uh, and lastly, if you have a look down the bottom uh, three curves, this is work done in Queensland uh, where they had a look at anyone with a diagnosis of, of amyloidosis. We found um, that most patients uh, died at about the two and a half year mark after diagnosis. There has been some improvement over time. Um, when they uh, broke it down, they saw that there was a really quite a big difference between in the 90s compared to um, the last uh, five years. But what was interesting is that patients definitely live longer if they are treated in a centre of excellence. This isn't to to their horn. This is really just that we can't treat every single patient with amyloidosis in the state. But if we can work together, I think that most patients should be seen at least once at an AAN service to confirm the diagnosis and come up with a treatment plan. And as I said, we have diflunazole on some clinical trials and I think that that um, does equate to improved survival for patients. And we, we would hand them back to the referring physician in the vast majority of cases. So to sum up, um, so the, getting the diagnosis right and early is really important and essential. Um, to, we have to distinguish between the AL and the TTR types. That TTR immunohistochemistry is mandatory for cardiac biopsies. And if you're in, in any doubt, please feel free to give us a call or do some mass spectrometry if you don't want to give us a call. Um, bone scintigraphy and genetic testing. So I didn't really speak about hereditary TTR testing but I tend to do it in, in with the disorder, um, any man under the age of 70 at diagnosis or if they have any neuropathy. Um, I mentioned that localised uh, disease can often just be observed or cut out, but we still need to exclude systemic disease, so I need a full workup. Um, please not only do the serum electrophoresis, light chains, urine electrophoresis, looking for a bench Jones protein, so that we, is it, do they have an MGUS or do they not? Um, but also do the cardiac biomarkers, especially the NT, proven P and troponin T, although we can sort of get away with the BNP and the troponin I. Um, so we would very much encourage clinical trials. Um, there's lots of new treatments for AL amyloidosis and for TTR amyloidosis, as I've mentioned, but I think that supportive care and multidisciplinary uh, team environment is really, really helpful. Um, I think we were grossly underdiagnosed um, early satiety gastric autonomic neuropathy uh, with gastroparesis or cardiac cachexia, and I just find that domperidone is incredibly helpful. Um, patients eat more, they feel better, they have more energy. Um, and for those with significant hypotension, um, I use Mitadrine quite a lot. I find it very effective in the short to medium term, um, especially in AL amyloidosis to get them back on their feet, literally. 
Um, and if they do have a low albumin, then once or twice a week, albumin infusions is really helpful. You can mobilize their fluid. They can see their ankles again. They stop being so dyspneic and they think that you've got. Um, so it's, it's really extraordinary. Um, and for those with, you know, really bad neuropathy, um, again, you know, we've got lots of treatments. So Lyrica and Amitriptyline can be very, very helpful. Um, so I still think that monoclonal antibodies are a real hope for AL amyloidosis. Mass spec has really helped us distinguish between the different types. And I think that antisense oligonucleotides and silencing RNA technology will hopefully allow us to find a cure. Um, so just a reminder, if you've got an older man over the age of 70 with heart failure and a history of carpal tunnel, they have amyloidosis, do a bone scan. And on that, I think that's me. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dirk.